Twilight's Kingdom is a supremely satisfying and surprisingly action-packed episode of MLP with a competent, if predictable, conclusion to the plotline concerning the keys, with lots of fun moments spread throughout the episode. Upon completing it, I proclaimed on Twitter that, while it's not perfect, it's pretty close. And then I watched it a second time. Perhaps that statement was a bit too generous. It was weird. After my first viewing, I immediately sat down to write the script and was met with a lot of resistance. I liked the episode, but I was having difficulty articulating my excitement. It was just fun. Not much more to it than that. And then it hit me. Twilight's Kingdom is a lot like Canterlot Wedding, in so much that, on the surface, it's incredibly enjoyable and has a great mix of action and emotion that makes it for an easy viewing experience. However, watch it a few more times and start to think about its going-ons and some things start to cause a bit of concern. Granted, I still am overall pretty positive about Canterlot Wedding, and I think Twilight's Kingdom is better still even than that episode, but I think the basic concept remains. This story is a lot more fun the less you think about it. But we'll get to that in a second. Let's start with the fun stuff. Fucking Tarek, okay? This guy is one evil motherfucker. I remember BronyCon 2013, after Saber, Race, Beavids, Paleo, and I watched Rescue from Midnight Castle for the MST3K panel. We were talking about how boss it would be if they adapted Tarek into a G4 villain, since he was so much more imposing than everything else around him in that special, and then BAM! There he is! Wish granted! Thanks, McCarthy. The fact that we get a peek at the revised lore surrounding Tyrek and Scorpan, as well as the connection to Star Swirl the Bearded, is just awesome. The world building really felt like it opened up a lot more here. It was short and to the point, but the world of Equestria once again feels even bigger, and that's never a bad thing. Not to mention Celestia dropped Tyrek off in Tartarus. Twice. Apparently, you don't fuck with Celestia. Between sending you to the moon or essentially damning you to hell, she doesn't mess around with her punishments. Speaking of Tartarus, the fact that it took such an inconsequential gag from Season 2 with Cerberus escaping in It's About Time and tied it back into allowing Tyrek to escape is so friggin' ridiculous and unnecessary, it transcends its own nonsense and becomes badass. I mean, they already established Tartarus. There was no reason to establish Tyrek's escape this way other than to just do it for the lulls. Wait a minute. If Tyrek was locked in Tartarus, and Cerberus leaving is what allowed him to escape, then that means that Twilight's worrying during the events of its about time were actually totally founded. Next Tuesday was around the time that Tyrek escaped and started regaining his powers. It may have looked like another normal Tuesday morning, but somewhere... Hidden in the depths of the shadows of the Everfree, an ancient evil took its first steps out of the bowels of imprisonment and back into the land of the living, intent on once again asserting its dominance over the world and breaking all those who had once dared defy it. Fuck. Tyrek himself is an imposing presence, easily taking his place as one of the best villains this show has put forth. He's both physically powerful and manipulative, a potent combination for a villain. His first action on screen is to drain a pony of their life force, steal their cutie mark, and essentially leave them for dead. He then proceeds to do this to just about every pony in Equestria. The way he is constantly becoming bigger and more physically imposing as he absorbs more magic is also a great touch culminating in an almost Sentai-esque giant growth at the end of the episode, and he is eventually able to steal not only unicorn magic, but Pegasi Flight and Earth Pony Strength as well. This, I found particularly interesting, as there's a prevalent fan-in theory that Pegasi fly using their own special brand of magic, since their wings are too small to generate enough lift on their own, and that Earth Ponies have a special magic that connects them to nature. And while I've always kind of dismissed the former as animation does what it does, the latter has always kind of intrigued me. Tarek's ability to steal all three tribes' abilities as well as their cutie marks, seems to link all three of these as definitively magical phenomena, all stemming from a singular arcane source that Tarek can harness. Not particularly relevant, but interesting to note nonetheless. As physically imposing as Tyrek is, he isn't just throwing around brute strength here, he's also just as cunning, which was awesome. In the beginning of the episode, he's still rather weak, to the point where Discord could have easily stopped him right then and there, but Tyrek is quick to find Discord's soft spot when his subservient position to the princesses, and used it to his advantage, turning the still morally ambiguous Discord against his new friends. Likewise, when Super Twilight proves to be a match for him, Tyrek wastes no time using her friends as leverage to get what he wants. This guy is just ruthless. Discord is certainly still my favorite villain, but 
but Tyrik is probably the most imposing and the most threatening, just as he should be given the G1 character he's based upon. So in response to this threat, the princesses decide to give Twilight all of their magic so Tyrik can't take it for himself. Not gonna lie, when I first saw this preview clip, I was kinda bummed out, considering that Celestia was telling Twilight to not tell her friends about her new powers, cause the whole subtitle of the show is Friendship is Magic. When have her friends not being in the loop ever been helpful? Cause that worked out for you so well in the season 4 premiere, right? But thankfully, when given proper context, it kinda makes sense. Twilight is the new princess in town, and Tyrik doesn't know about her. So she can take some time, master her princess powers, then lay down the smack on Tyrik with a new Super Saiyan power boost. The less ponies that know about this, the less chance that Tyrik can find out. It's a good plan. Too bad you forgot how you guys love to brag about all your accomplishments on giant stained glass windows, or that Discord, who you know betrayed you guys, cause you were just talking about that, is more than well aware of Twilight's existence. Yeah, didn't think this one through very well, did you? The resulting throwdown with Tyrik and Twilight was friggin' insane though, easily ousting the Changeling Smackdown as the most intense fight sequence of the show. The fact that I can use fight sequence and My Little Pony in the same sentence still baffles me. As soon as Tyrik destroyed Twilight's library in a spectacular fireball of death and Twilight looks in despair upon the burning pages of the book she just established and Traja carried sentimental value to her, you just knew it was on, and the subsequent Dragon Ball inspired brawl was both fantastically animated as well as surprisingly full contact for a show like My Little Pony considering its demographic. Considering most villains in the show have been vanquished with love beams and deus ex rainbows, having a full on energy beam battle was a surprising change of pace and further cemented Tyrik as a genuine threat, instantly making his presence seem the most threatening out of all the show's rogues gallery thus far. And then we have the Rainbow Box. Like every other adventure arc, the third act here comes off a bit rushed, with Discord's forgiveness, Twilight's key, the unlocking of the chest, the rainbow power transformation, and Tyrik's defeat being extremely fast, one right after the other. But I can say that I like the fact that it wasn't jacked Twilight that defeats Tyrik, but the main six as a whole who were able to come together and take him down. Just when the episode was at risk of becoming too Twilight-centric and ignoring the rest of the main cast, it takes a step back, using the long-standing plot device of the Harmony Box to bring all of its characters back into the fold. And and that really only leaves us with Discord. I'm... mixed on his presence in this episode. I think we've all been wondering in the back of our minds why Celestia even bothered releasing him in the first place if he hasn't really done anything, proving to cause more trouble than anything else. And while it seems like there was quite a bit of time between releasing him and him finally being useful, I'm glad to have him be useful nonetheless. Another long-standing question has been why he hasn't just said fuck it and unleashed all hell upon Equestria with the elements out of the way, and Tyrik hits the nail right on the head by essentially bringing up this very point. Discord's disposition is completely different being one of the good guys, and having him face this fact is a great thing to bring up. I'll admit, I thought he was gaming Tyrik the whole time to help out Twilight since he obviously had the whole rainbow box thing figured out this entire episode, if not this entire season, but having him be the one to give Twi her key was a nice approach as well, even if it seems like he probably should have seen this betrayal coming from Tyrik, being the character who's been shown to be the most aware of the big picture and the majority of his appearances, it seems that Discord's judgement is continually clouded by his desire for companionship, which I suppose is a rather humanizing trait, though it does make one wonder why he even considered betraying Flutters in the first place if he values friendship so much. He isn't even sour about being betrayed by Tyrik so much that he has once again lost his freedom, but because he seemed to consider Tyrik a friend? Well, if all you really wanted was a friend, why abandon Fluttershy in the first place? Again, it's supposed to be for freedom and power, but Discord's never shown to want those things again after the initial encounter with Tyrik. I could keep going on in circles with this, and again, overall I like what they did with Discord here, but I think the reason I'm kind of on the fence with some of his motivations is because his actions hinge on his relationship with Fluttershy versus his desire for power and freedom. And while Return of Harmony painted a very clear picture of a Discord enjoying the latter, we've never really experienced Discord's relationship with Fluttershy firsthand. Sure, we've been told about it, even a few times in this episode, but without any real grounding and observable plot points from an episode, it's hard to really identify with this part of Discord's character. I wish we could have been made privy to more of Discord and Fluttershy's relationship throughout this season. It would have made his betrayal more resonant, and his despair over seemingly undermining his friendship with Flutters once he gets fucked over a bit more believable. As it stands, it's thematically sound, but lacks any evidence beyond what we've been casually told in passing, rather than see it happen. So there was that. Do I have any other issues? <laughs> Come on, remember whose channel you're watching here. I'm kind of confused with Twilight here in the beginning of this episode. She's complaining about how she feels her role as a princess is completely hollow and she has no responsibilities. But 
Ever since she's ascended, she's been going out of her way to downplay her new position. In both Equestria Girls and the season premiere, she is afraid of inheriting new responsibilities due to her newly gained authority. I have no problem with Twilight growing into her role and wanting to take it more seriously, but we were never given any clues or shown even in passing that her mindset concerning being a princess was shifting. Hell, Trajan was three episodes ago when she was adamant on her princess status meaning nothing. It just seems like they decided to leverage the whole stereotypical Disney princess I want more motivation, which seems to be a terrible motif to take inspiration from if you ask me, since many people have put such a motivation under scrutiny. I don't know, this motivation quickly takes a backseat to the greater conflict, but it doesn't change the fact that it feels totally out of place with how Twilight has communicated her feelings on her ascension this entire season. So, the keys were totally wrapped up in an acceptable way in this episode, but what about the castle of the two sisters? It was made to be a big deal and became a recurring location... why exactly? I was expecting it to be rainbow-fied into Twilight's castle come the end of the episode, but instead a crystal castle tree thingy just magically sprouts out of the middle of Ponyville. So, much like the Equestria games, what was the point of even bringing this place up? I mean, yeah, they go there this episode to look for information about the Harmony Box, but they don't find anything. Twilight gets the answer from their journal and Discord's bookmarks, and that could have happened anywhere. It didn't have to happen at the castle, so what was it there to do? Apparently nothing. This isn't really a problem per se, more of just a weird oddity? I don't get it. Something that was pointed out to me, since I was too busy enjoying the Dragon Ball Z battle to care, is that Twilight goes from struggling to maintain a proper teleport spell to suddenly holding her own with Tyrik, complete with focused Kamehameha Blast and Precision Flying. I mean, right before Tyrik shows up, she botches her teleportation spell and overshoots then slams right into Tyrik's leg trying to fly over to him. They don't even pretend to have her gain control of her powers off screen. I guess having your house blown up provides you with some compelling motivation to get your shit together, but still, it doesn't really make much sense. But that fight scene was friggin' awesome, so I don't really give a shit! Also, while I think the move of getting rid of the elements of Harmony in the beginning of this season was badass, it seems like their new rainbow powers are functionally identical to the elements, serving the same deus ex machina plot resolution that the elements of the past did. A lot of us, including myself, praise the show for getting rid of the get out of a conflict free card that they provided, but in the very next scenario that requires one, the main six get level two element powers from the harmony box, essentially making that sacrifice in the beginning of the season pointless. I suppose it's not really fair to say that about the elements or the rainbow powers though, as they're supposed to be tangible representations of the main six friendship, and the show was trying to communicate that friendship is powerful and all that, and from the perspective of a metaphor it works, but when examining them as an actual weapon in the fantasy world they exist in, they're both OP reset buttons. I don't know, I'm just kind of bitching at this point. Also, those rainbow power designs are still fucking disgusting. See, more bitching. Overall though, these complaints aren't enough to get too bad out of shape over when stacked up against the good happening here. Twilight's Kingdom, against all odds, dodged nearly every pitfall and corporate trapping thrown at it and delivered an action-packed payoff to the key arc, easily being not only the finale with the largest scope, but probably the most fun one as well, even if it was not the most airtight in terms of plot. With a giant palace now in the center of Ponyville, and the main six with an even more powerful version of the Elements of Harmony at their command, I'm interested to see where the show decides to go with Season 5. I guess we'll find out in the fall. Sometimes I think my head is filled with clouds Picking up the storm when I feel it down I can't put it in words like you can don't matter cause you understand Sometimes I think that I am overwhelmed By the vastness of my realm Reaching up the sun splits in five And somehow I know